welcome everybody. Thanks for thanks for coming along to uh, what should be a, a fascinating um, one ash tech talk today. Um, creativity and AI, companions or competitors. Uh, my name is Dave King. I'll be hosting um, what is a, a wonderful panel of uh, globally renowned experts that have been brought together today. Um, but I'd like to begin with a, an acknowledgement to country. Uh, by respectfully asking you to acknowledge the Wurundjeri and the Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation, the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we are meeting on today, and pay respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Uh, so, like I said, this is going to be, a, this is going to be a, a great discussion around creativity and AI and the intersection and, and, and different interesting aspects of, of those two topics as they come together. Um, and I'll, I'll move into introducing um, the panellists now. So firstly, uh, from Monash um, itself, we have Professor John McCormick, who's a director and founder of Sensi Lab. Um, John is a professor in the Faculty of Information Technology at Monash, an ARC Future Fellow, founder and a director of Sensi Lab. Um, he's an Australian-based artist and researcher in computing. His research interests include generative art, design, music, evolutionary systems, computer creativity, visualization, virtual reality, interaction design, physical computing, machine learning development models and physical computing. I said physical computing twice there. You must be a really renowned expert. Um, welcome, John. Thanks for, thanks for coming along to the panel. Thanks, Dave. Long intro. <laughs> uh, we also have um, Prof Professor Sarah Pink, uh, a world leading design anthropologist. Uh, she's director of Emerging Technologies at Research Lab. Uh, and she has a joint appointment across the Faculty of IT and the Faculty of Art, Design and Architecture. She's been researching how people live and use technologies in their homes for over 20 years in Australia, the UK, Spain, Brazil, and Indonesia. Uh, she's known for innovative digital, visual, and sensory approach to research um, and addresses contemporary challenges through projects that incorporate design, engineering, and creative practice disciplines. Uh, welcome, Sarah. Thanks, Dave. Um, and finally, um, but by no means least, is uh, Dr. Teresa Lana Rodriguez, who is a lecturer of Creative AI in the Faculty of Information Technology. Uh, her research focuses on computational creativity, and this means applying tools and techniques from different areas of AI uh, to enable software systems to be collaborative collaborators, as uh, creative collaborators, sorry, and developing tools that support designers and making technologies more accessible. She's currently investigating the development of novel models of human computer co-creation. Welcome, Teresa. Hi, Dave. Thank you. So to get things started, I wanted to ask you all uh, a question, a more of a framing question, I guess, for this topic. Um, one of the core, I guess, premises of this whole event, um, it's, and it's a fascinating one, very topical in a lot of industries and a lot of um, academic um, environments, is, uh, is creative creativity and AI, are they opposing forces? Um, I'd love to know what your perspective on this, and if they're not opposing, What's the relationship between two? Obviously, this is the this is the topic that we want to sort of tease out with lots of different aspects. Um, so, are they opposing forces? How do you see that? And uh, what are your thoughts? I might throw to you first, John, if that works. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I think yeah, you're right. It's a really interesting question. I mean, maybe a good thing to start with is, you know, what what are we really talking about when we talk about creativity? So, I see there's this broad thing called creativity, which is quite nebulous and I, you know, in my opinion, I think there's a lot of things that are creative that aren't human. So, you know, you could think of the universe as being creative, nature as being creative, uh, some animals could be creative. But if we think about human creativity, um, I think that's a specific aspect of intelligence and also it's quite varied. So, and I think it's a similar relationship with AI. So AI is this broad kind of nebulous term that encompasses a whole of different things. And um, it's possible for things to be competitive, it's possible for them to be cooperative, and it's really up to us in terms of how we design the systems. That's really interesting. So I might, I might add something to your, um, your perspective on this, Sarah. Um, firstly, um, do you see them as opposing forces? Um, but also just to pick up on something that John said, in your industry, do you have a working definition of creativity that, that helps you um, sort of tease out these kind of issues? Yeah, thanks. I don't know. I don't see them as necessarily opposing forces. I see them as being part of the same world, the same environment that we live in, in which technologies, humans, other species, other things, other processes, the air and the wind and, and everything around us is, is really part of the same 
kind of ongoing process in which they, they kind of work together. Um, I'm an anthropologist. So for me, human creativity is really at the basis of, of everyday human life. Creativity is not just something that creatives do. It's not just something designers or artists or other creative professionals engage in. Human creativity is what we do every moment of the day. It's, it's what enables us to take the next step forward. Um, it's what we're precisely doing in this webinar. We, we don't have, I don't think we will have notes um, which will enable us to answer the questions you know, automatically as they go ahead. We're using our human creativity to put ideas together, to put our thoughts together and to take that step forward. And it's what all people do as we live our lives, not just as we speak, as we do every, every day, ordinary everyday tasks, as well as those people who engage in, in kind of arts and creative, kind of creative practice that comes into the public domain and is named as creativity. We're all creative. I have heard that a few times in, in this kind of field, um, people say um, it, it's fine to sort of try, try and work out if we, if we can develop artificial intelligence, but first we have to understand what intelligence is. And, and the same goes for creativity, artificial creativity. I don't think you know, there's one definition or it doesn't seem like sort of globally, some people refer to, to Margaret Bowden as a, as a, a great way to sort of understand creativity, but others kind of go, it is, you know, it, 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 it's in all of us. It's not a pre-prescribed thing. Teresa, in your work, it's, it's interesting because I mean, obviously you work very close to um, understanding the relationship between, um, within creativity, the, um, the human and the machine and co-creation. But so do you see them as opposing forces and, and how do you tackle that in, in, in your work? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, first of all, yeah, you're right. Uh, creativity is such a, such a subjective term that is very just very difficult to to uh, define. One person can think of something as creative and another person something else is creative. But I agree with Sarah, you know, with what we do every day, everything, everything it, it requires creativity. And I, I don't see creativity and AI as opposing forces. I actually believe that they enable each other. And, and it's like uh, creativity, you know, challenges AI uh, a lot, you know, and drives the, the field further, you know, like, okay, you can do, do this, you know, there are all these new AI technologies that they can do very uh, amazing things, process a lot of information and data, but what else can you do? What can, how can go, you go beyond that? So it, mm -hmm. they enable each other and AI, uh, it's the same, you know, like, okay, you, you, um, we have these challenges from you and we are able to do this and we have these new technologies. So, you know, it, it inspires people, it inspires researchers to, to do more things that they didn't think were possible. Uh, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think, I think that uh, they challenge each other and they enable each other in many different ways. That makes a lot of sense. So the next question, I'll throw you first, Sarah. Um, you know, when it comes to sort of creative endeavours and, you know, humans working with machines um, in the creative realm, do you think um, there, there are different tasks or different capabilities that, you know, that the human does better than the machine and, and vice versa? Yes, of course. And I, I don't think there's a definitive statement on that, in that I think that that relationship between humans and machines is continually evolving. And, and what we can see now is going to be different again in, in the near future and in the far future. But there's certain um, kind of modes of modes of human knowing and, and everyday practice and you know, ability um, to, to cope with continually changing situations and environments, um, which is based on a very sensory, unthought about kind of way of knowing as we engage with the, the materials that we use when we make things, the, the environments around us, the, the lights, the, the sounds, and, and those kinds of kind of sensors sensory ways of being and knowing which are very human um, are not the same um, as machine creativity and I think you know that's where we start to come into really interesting questions about the relationship between machine learning and the way that machines can know and the way that humans know you know how long will it be before sensor technologies are able to actually sense environments in ways that are, are more similar to humans um, or, or how, how would they be able to do that and, and how would they be able to learn to actually engage with those environments and in patterns that really do follow the way that a human might engage with them. But I guess, um, and I don't know the technological part of that, I think that John and Teresa probably have a much kind of better awareness of how far that kind of research has progressed. But I think I know from the discussions I've had with people around various different industries, um, thinking about, for example, the, the very kind of complex work that 
somebody might do when they're making something in a construction site, for example. You know, that, that work can be very precise, can be constantly changing. No construction site would ever be the same, exactly identical to another one. So workers in that kind of industry are always working in a new and very different environments. Um, so yes, the replicability of the situations that machines would be creative in is, is also an interesting question. But I, I really turn to my colleagues um, to yeah. tell me more about those questions too. No, I think that's really interesting. I think you brought up a topic I just want to, I guess, um, throw to John to, to hear his perspective on this. There are, there are people who believe that, you know, AGI or general, in, general intelligence can't be achieved unless, um, you know, you, you have a body, unless you can experience, experience the world, just as Sarah said, with, with sort of true sensory perception. It's not about necessarily, um, you know, binary data and machine learning models, unsupervised models, those kind of things. It, it's, it's you have to have a body to truly understand the world. Um, that is a perspective that, you know, you read about. What's your thoughts on that one, John? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think that's, that's you know, true. Um, but if you unpack it a little bit more, there's certain aspects that maybe can be transferred that aren't, you know, part of bodily intelligence. So. The whole concept of AI, you know, it's been around for a very long time. And originally, I think the conception was that intelligence was this kind of cerebral thing that happened. And it was like, you know, solving chess problems or all to do with logic and that kind of thing. And then, you know, gradually people realized, but hold on, there's a whole lot of intelligence that humans have and other animals have that involves having a body, involves this kind of sensory perception that um, Sarah was talking about earlier, sort of phenomenological experience of the world. And if you're a machine, you don't have that same experience of the world. Um, I mean, you only have to look at people like, you know, musicians, for example, who have this kind of physical dexterity with an instrument that they play. That's an inherent part of their creativity. And so obviously a machine doesn't have a human body. It can't play an instrument in the same way, even if it has you know, a fake body, a mechanical robotic body. So, yeah, there's there's certain aspects of, of certainly kinesthetic, what's called kinesthetic intelligence, body intelligence, having a body and being in the world that cannot be replicated by, you know, a, a, a standard computer sitting in a server farm somewhere. Mm. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Mm. Um, Teresa, what are your thoughts on, you know, again, this is probably cl very close to, to the work you've done over a number of years that, um, the, the, the question about whether you know, humans can do things better than machines and, and, and vice versa. Is there, is there a delegation of tasks that's, that's well understood? Uh, well, I don't think there is um, something uh, like a line in which you can, you know, uh, a clear line where you can say this is better here, better. But um, I, I agree with John and, and Sarah in which, you know, there are obviously things that we as humans can do that machines can't and like have life experiences and, and things that inspire us, feelings and all that of course is a big part of creativity. But I, I also have to, you know, vouch uh, for the AI, you know, in some way. And, and I just remembered um, an experience that I had when I was conducting uh, a study with two human musicians and an AI system. They were composing a piece, the, the, the two musicians, and they have the system. And one of them just played uh, a note of, you know, played a, a piece of music. And then the AI started exploring with that same um, piece of music and just started playing it really fast, very fast. And, and the, the, the uh, human musician that had played that, he was so amazed and he was like, oh, that sounds so much better, you know, and I could never... I could never play that fast, he said. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's so good, we should include that. So, you know, it's, it's like AI has uh, is, is ways of, of doing things better in, in some way, you know, processing information a lot faster, doing things that, that we just as humans can't. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's a very nice synergy between the two of them. Mm. I might um, use that opportunity to ask about something you've worked on in the past. There's, there's an audience question, which I'll get to after this, but. Um, Teresa, can you tell us about working on sort of co-creating a musical um, with with AI? What was the experience like that? What was what was that project about? Yeah, so um, we had uh, that was uh, I was in London then, and that was um, there were different uh, teams of researchers from different parts of uh, Europe, and the idea was that uh, each um, research team had a, a piece of software, a piece of AI that was going to be used to produce the first ever 
generated um, West End musical, mm -hmm. AI generated, AI generated West End musical. So we, uh, each of the teams, we had the, um, a task. In my team, we have to um, produce the seed idea of the whole story and a team in Spain have to produce the plot, you know, the basic blocks of the story. Um, another team have to produce the lyrics, the music, you know, so all these different things. And then uh, two musical writers um, made, uh, like join all these different pieces of work, bring them, brought them together with the actors and they put on this, this, um, this musical, this West End musical, it was, it was, um, um, shown in, in London for February and March of 2016, I think. Mm -hmm. It was called Beyond the Fence. And I mean, it was a lot of fun to do that. We work a lot with the, with, there was really a close a working relationship between the researchers, the AI systems, and the, you know, the people, the actors, the, the mm -hmm. musical writers. Um, yeah, we saw true collaboration there between the AI and, and, and the people there. So it was. I think that was probably one of the earlier projects in the, in this space that was you know really landing the AI coming out of its most recent winter and sort of creativity starting to be to be discussed. Um, Sarah, I'll throw to you. There's a, there's a quite an interesting audience question um, from Tom, and just I guess keeping in mind Teresa's um, project there, but also other other projects that we've seen in this space. How do we acknowledge the, the creative researcher who created the AI versus the artist who created the, the artwork? You now we've seen articles and, and maybe kind of hypotheses that maybe an AI itself can apply for patents or AI itself can, can do things. Um, but this whole, this whole sense of um, you know, who gets the credit and who claims ownership. Is a That's a very kind of interesting and complex question. It's complex from a whole range of perspectives. I mean, it's complex from the perspective of the, the artist of the creative um, researcher and the artist themselves and, and how they feel about that position. Um, it's also kind of an interesting question from a legal perspective as well, um, ownership perspective. So there, there's a lot there to unpack. Um, and it's an interdisciplinary question. It's not just a question for one person, one discipline to actually answer. Um, because once you start to think about AI having rights, then there are other ramifications um, beyond the question of the rights that an, an AI might have in relation to creative practice. Um, shouldn't AI have other rights in society and its relationships to humans? Um, how do we actually start conceptualizing that? So, so any decisions that are taken about the rights that an AI have, might have in this creative spin also need to be kind of, you need to see how they might unfold um, mm -hmm. into other areas and domains of life as well. So we're there, we, we start to really kind of edge in on some of those kind of very fundamental questions about the human and the non-human and how we will actually kind of live together as, as we move into our futures. So yes, that's a, I haven't answered your question. No, no, that's good. It's, it's, a lot of these questions aren't answerable. They're after sort of informed perspectives rather than kind of yes, no answers. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's an emerging field. And, and I think that the, the, what you've highlighted there is that, that very pointed question about um, a creative researcher, an AI and artist, actually is quite an expansive question about um, you know, all sorts of commercial and legal and economic issues way beyond you know, just the creation of the art piece. So I remember someone saying to me, um, how, how, can the, how can the AI have ownership of anything if, if it can't have responsibility for anything? With, with ownership comes responsibility. And if it can't be held responsible for you know, things in society, which, which is, is, is the case, then you've got to go to the human. Um, John, there was an artwork, I mean, there's been a few, art, obviously, you know, stories like this. There was an artwork in, I think it was auctioned at Sotheby's last year. Um, this issue came up um, because I think, if I recall correctly, that the, that the, the humans who co-created the artwork used an algorithm that already existed from someone. Is that right? Yeah, so it's kind of an interesting story. It was, um, it was positioned as one of the first um, AI-generated artworks, which is, you know, incorrect. <laughs> but after the sale it turned out that the three young French um, people who'd, who'd created it actually just used some open source code that they'd largely got from a single 19 year old developer who worked as an intern at Google Robbie Barrett was his name and they you know people went back through the sort of chat history of them asking him to add certain features so that it would you know the, the system that he was working with would do what they wanted it to do so then 
the question of authorship becomes even more complex when you take code written by someone else that's based on an idea that wasn't invented by Robbie Barrett either. It was invented by some research scientists at Google largely. And then you train it on data that belongs to museums and that was painted by human artists to produce something that you call art. There's an incredible sort of networked web of responsibility in mm. all of that. Um, and they refused to give Robbie Barrett, the 19 year old, any money for the sale, even though they, you know, they, they obviously received quite a lot of money for taking someone else's software and just printing out a picture with it. So, you um, just dropped out before when you were reading out, when you were saying the price, what was the price it sold for? It was about 600,000 Australian dollars, about 400, I mean, it depends on the dollar, but 480,000, yeah. I think, 430,000 US dollars. So it's a lot of money, too yeah. much money, in my opinion. Yeah. <laughs> um, Theresa, we might throw to you. I think um, what are some interesting things, you know, I, th I think the audience is interested in sort of um, specific examples or, or um, I mean, that, that is one that the Christie's auction, the Robbie Barrett story is, is, a, is a fascinating one. What things have you seen recently um, that have sort of, you know, excited you or given you a, a, a clue as to where things might be going or might be headed? Actually, I'll open this up to anybody. If anybody's got a, a specific story that they wanted to, or an example of something they've seen. Uh, I think, um, I mean, there's, there are so many things in my mind, but um, in general, I think is the, the, what we are going towards the real collaboration, you know? So more and more, we are um, starting to, to work with the AI instead of just using the AI as a tool. So that's, that's kind of, um, more, more what I'm going towards. And uh, examples of that, for instance, in music, uh, there have been some new developments in which people are actually using music systems to compose. And, and one example of that is this uh, content, uh, the, what is the call, Bureau, you know, John, can you tell me with that one? The, the Sorry, which, which one, Teresa, I missed your... The, um, the contest that just won an Australian um, oh yes, there was a Eurovision, Australian Eurovision, Eurovision AI yeah. song contest. Yeah, sorry, it Eurovision, and it was about composing a, a, a song, and it was composed by, a, by an AI. Uh, so that's the kind of thing, and it was sung by by humans. So that's kind of the kind of thing that you know it, it goes to show the way that humans and AI can work together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, I think in the next few years you're going to see AI technologies integrated into traditional creative software tools. So, you know, many, many people who work in, in uh, photography or visual um, illustration or art use um, applications like Photoshop, for example. So already Photoshop has some machine learning built into it, but it's likely that those tools are going to have an increasing amount of AI um, mm -hmm. built into them that assist, but you still conceptualize them more as in sort of intelligent tools. You don't ascribe any sort of creative autonomy to the tool itself and similar in music. So, many musicians are now using AI technologies to help them compose a song, but there's still a huge and vast array of human talent and creativity behind producing a song that, you know, is that, that's successful. And similarly with any kind of creative endeavor. So I think it's still a long way before you actually get this sense that an AI is a real creative force in something rather than just more like a, a kind of a tool that augments human intelligence, but is not really competing against it. Yeah, I saw some pretty um, amazing demos on the weekend of, of Runway ML. If, mm. if you're in the audience and you're interested in this stuff, look up Runway. And, and it's the kind of thing you talked about, that having the context-aware feeling kind of aspects of Photoshop, except, you know, open on steroids so you can kind of move a skateboarder around and then the shadow automatically renders in the right place based on the light source and that kind of thing because it's been trained to do that. And it still feels like a tool. It still feels like a productivity tool, but it's pretty extraordinary um, technology. Sarah, what have you seen um, in, in this space or in your work that kind of gives you a, a suggestion on where some of these um, things might be going? Um, I think we need to think about the way some of these things might be going from, a, from another perspective as well. Um, you know, a lot of the talk is about what technologies can do. Um, what, what is the capacity, what is the capability of a technology? How advanced is it? You know, how, how creative can it be? Um, all of those questions, and th those questions are are interesting for engineers, for technology designers, people who make technologies. But there's another underpinning question that we need to put first, which as I've kind of advocated it in various domains, that should be the ethics first question. 
So rather than considering, you know, how advanced can the technologies get and what can they do for us, we need to ask two other questions first. One of them is, what is the ethical context that we want to, to put them into? What do we really, how do we want them to work in our society? How do we want them to intervene in individual lives and in creative practices? Um, and the, the other one, the other question is the people first question. How do we actually, what do people really want such technologies to do? How far do we want them to, to kind of bury their way into our everyday lives? Mm. Um, you know, do we really need to, you know, um, a, an assistant, an, an intelligent assistant to finish our sentences for us as when we write our emails? Um, how many of those things really add to our lives? Do we, so, so how far do we really need this to go? It's one question is if we can, which is, you know, the technological possible. There's the invention of the, the problems that the technolo technolo technological solutions are often created for problems that technologists suppose that we have, but they've never stopped to ask whether we actually need those solutions. So, you know, I think there's, we're at a moment where well, we really need to stand back and mm -hmm. ask ourselves how far we would like these technologies to go. But I would, I would make another point before I kind of, I don't want to close on that exactly because I think that, you know, the work that John's doing is, is rather different um, in terms of exploring those relationships between artificial intelligence and art and creativity. And there's one side of it is to, is to explore and to research and to create marvelous, interesting and, and aesthetic and, and experiential, you know, projects and, and, and processes through that. Um, so, there are, there are lots of very different domains in which these kinds of technological design and development processes are playing out in. Um, but there really are some that we need to watch in terms of the ethics first. Kind of yeah, I think, I think that's, a, that's a great point, whether it's creativity or other aspects of AI, other crossovers. Mm -hmm. um, there's an audience question that's related to that, which we'll get to in a little while from, from Pradeep. But John, on that, on, on your work, um, you mentioned something interesting the other day. You said that human intelligence wasn't necessarily, wasn't necessarily the only basis on which to model artificial intelligence or artificial creativity. What did, what did you mean by that? Are we, are we being too narrow in, in, in considering human intelligence as the, as the main goal here? A lot of the discoveries that um, AI has made, particularly in the kind of design space, relate to um, designs that humans could never come up with, things that look foreign that look alien and if you show a designer like an engineer or a designer something they'd look at it and go that's crazy it would never work it's impossible and yet it turns out to be um, orders of magnitude often better than what the best human designer could do so i think the, you know the first step in understanding about ai is to recognize that it doesn't have to be like a human it doesn't have to duplicate or replicate what humans can do and in fact it may be more interesting to look at all the things that humans can't do. And but with that also comes the danger, as Sarah um, alluded to, about the ethical responsibilities, particularly if the technology starts accelerating very rapidly and you eventually get to a point where the intelligence is kind of beyond your understanding or beyond your control. And that's where you get into the, you know, the area of existential risk. Crikey. Okay. That's something to watch out for. Um, uh, that's a beautiful segue to something I want to ask uh, Teresa, especially about, you know, if, if we're getting to AI that we can't actually sort of see into the black box and we can't understand how it's making its recommendations or its, or its generative um, outputs or, or its suggestions. Um, how important is, is, is explainable AI um, in, in your work, in, in creativity, um, you know, more specifically? Yeah, I mean, um of course, first is what Sarah and, and John has said. Ethically, we have a responsibility with AI, the AI that we build, and, and we need to be able to understand uh, the process that the AI is taking and the decisions that is taking. So this is for general, you know, general AI, it applies this. Um, but for creativity, I think the the role of explainable AI, apart from that as well, is to be able uh, for uh, um, you know, creative AI to really um, ha have a, an active role in a collaboration. If we really want, at some point, to create together with a with a machine, machines have to be able to explain themselves. Machines have to be able to to support what they have done and why they have done it. Otherwise, is it is just too easy to turn off the machine and just go away and forget about whatever the machine says. And this is not how collaboration works. And I think because of the creative process as humans, when we collaborate with each other, we, we have a voice, you know, in that collaboration. We are able to defend our ideas and to push for them. 
how much do we want a machine to push? That's another thing that we, we need to, 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 to understand, you know, and to study. But I think uh, it is very important in the creative uh, context for machines to be able to have a voice and to be able mm -hmm. to, to, to explain and, and push uh, and defend their, their creations. I think that's interesting. I think, I think what Sarah said before is true of the, the fact that a lot of the, the sort of cutting edge technologies are technical um, challenges, not necessarily, not necessarily kind of human problems to solve. And, and possibly a lot of the focus and, and interesting work has been on um, pushing the technology you know, to, to create incredible outputs rather than considering ethics and, and also explainability. And I think, yeah. I think you're right. If it's a true collaboration, if it's a human to human collaboration, you're allowed to interrogate each other's ideas and yeah. sort of, have this kind of feedback loop and Q&A thing and we probably don't even notice we're doing it we just kind of go you know why do you think that and how did you come up with that and blah 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 um, yeah. John in, in, in sort of human and machine creativity um, how close are we to having collaboration you mentioned before that a lot of the probably a lot of the sort of commercial applications we're seeing are still kind of I guess you would imagine as, as a tool rather than necessarily a you know a peer or a colleague how close are we um, to sort of having true collaboration with, with AI and creative realms? I think we're still a long way away from that. Um, there's, I mean, there's certain, in, in very specific areas, there's been some really interesting examples of collaboration. And even if I think about the, my way of working with computers, I mean, I couldn't do the work that I do, the creative work that I do without computers. So in a sense, I'm reliant on a machine, but a machine working in a very specific way that's, that's specific to my kind of artistic practice and the way that I think about creativity. Um, but that's the kind of beauty of, of a computer is it doesn't have to be a one size fits all um, thing either, that it can be adaptive to the particular way that you like to work. And not everyone actually, you know, if you've been in kind of creative partnerships with people, sometimes one person is quite dominant and the other person just kind of, you know, sits in the background and does, does some things that you think were really helpful and useful, but perhaps are not with the same amount of what you might call creative agency that the, the lead um, creative does. A standard thing is like a director of a movie, right? The director is generally considered to be the lead creative, but there's a whole bunch of other people working with that director to, to, to produce a cinematic film. Um, and there's, there's a huge amount of creativity that's, that comes from each of the roles in that kind of collaboration. Mm. Um, so I think it's very specific. There's still a long way to go. I mean, there's even the state of the art machine learning that we're seeing at the moment, it's very, you know, technically it's very interesting, but I think culturally and creatively, it's far less interesting for me as a, as a creative practitioner um, than, than some work that was, that's been going on for the last 20 or 30 years. So even though there's, there's a lot of really exciting things ahead, I still think it's probably going to be decades or centuries before we really see a genuine creative partnership emerging. Sarah, I want to pick up on something John's just said. I think, I think some of these aspects, you know, we're, we're, we're drawn to sort of almost looking to the science fiction realm to see where this might be heading. Um, but something a bit closer to home and, and, and possibly um, something a bit more concrete is, is, is a field that you're um, particularly involved in, which is automated decision making. What, what exactly is automated decision making and how does that relate to um, or differ from AI in, in creativity? Yeah, I think that there's some interesting, some interesting questions here because, um, you know, AI is so, so associated with science fiction with these kind of much more dramatic, much more spectacular ways in which, um, you know, intelligent machines and automated processes can actually intervene in our lives and there's and this has been going on for so many years that there's this massive popular imaginary about you know ai and what ai is going to look like what it's going to be able to do how people are going to have relationships with it so you know i think for people who work in, in the field of ai that must be you know an enormous kind of um, part of, of their work, if you like, in terms of having to kind of engage with those those popular conceptions of, of artificial intelligence, where it is in our future. But um, well, I'm one of the CIs in the um, the ARC Centre of Excellence for Automated Decision Making in Society. And I think what's particularly important about the work of the centre is that um, you know, we, we, nearly, we really actually need to study how modes of automation are actually already becoming part of our everyday lives. So rather than thinking about a kind of a future imaginary where we have um, AI assistants or AI governing our lives in some way, we really need to start to look to some of the existing examples of the way that automated processes and automated, automated decisions that are happening in our everyday world. So 
Um, there's an organization called Algorithm Watch based in, in Europe who has a report on, on automated decision making from, from a social perspective and has explored a whole range of examples, um, which show very well, you know, how um, automation can be applied very effectively to certain processes and, and activities, but also what some of the kind of ethical dangers and, and questions are around that. And they have an interesting kind of definition of um, automated decision making because they say that it's a delegation of a, of a decision mm -hmm. to a machine. And the important question there is who delegates the decision? So what we need to think back to then is that modes of automation and, and modes of um, artificial intelligence um, they, they need to be understood as of having that human involvement. I'm also part of a network called the Rehumanising Automated Decision Making Network, which is funded by um, a research council in Sweden with a group of people across Finland, Sweden, Denmark and Australia. And in that project as, as well, our, we, we're putting the human back into the questions around automation. And that reminder that humans are very much part of automated and, and intelligent you know, machine processes. So one of the questions um, I've noticed um, by, by from, from Pradeep is, is interesting because um, the question there is, should AI be regulated? Well, um, it kind of leads us to that kind of question. Should AI be regulated? Um, or should we actually be taking a step back and saying, well, what's wrong with our society in such a way that we would need to regulate AI? Surely, first, we need to, what we need to regulate is, is how things are done and the way that power, how is power held, how is power used? Um, within our contemporary societies. Um, it's not AI necessarily that's going to do the damage. Right? It's actually our existing societal structures and power relations and inequalities, of which we have seen so many mm -hmm. in the recent political, environmental and public health crisis, which is you know, all over our, our world and all it, over the news right now. It, it's an interesting topic because I think people start to think about it. I think people start to question algorithms and, and, and kind of it's kind of emerged more at sort of, you know, dinner tables and sort of dinner party conversations around, you know, you know how, how, what's your Facebook feed recommending you or did you see that and all those kind of things or just, you know, is Instagram listening to my phone, all that kind of stuff. But also I remember seeing um, Kate Crawford's artwork in Mona in Hobart just before it closed, which is, which is a huge diagram of, of how Alexa, you know, works. And, it, and most of it behind the scenes is, is underpaid labour, human labour doing all sorts of things, the, the ethical challenges you've, you've, you've alluded to, the, the bias in the training, all those kind of things. But to see that in such a sort of public forum like a, like a, you know, a big art gallery in Australia, it's, I think it's probably you know, hinting towards this is, a, this is a mainstream issue, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. And it's, mm. it's a societal problem, a political problem. Um, so I'm, I guess I'm not so worried about what the algorithms are going to do no. um, or about them being let loose to do something themselves I, I'm, I'm much more concerned about the, the who made them who made the algorithms and what's what's their agenda um which, and i think it's interesting i think the other thing pradeep's mentioned in the in the question about how i being regulated is um uh is deep fakes so you now obviously a u.s election year um there's a lot of probably, you know, fair <laughs> um, concern about the, the issue of um, deep fakes in, um, in the 2020 elections in the US. John, do you have a perspective on, on whether, the, you know, we can put these things out into the world as far as, you know, deep fakes is, is, is being able to sort of generate um, um, very, very realistic video um, with virtually no kind of human touch. Um, but of course, it has, you know, nefarious uses as well. Is it still worth exploring that or is that does the, um, the potential misuse outweigh the benefit? Yeah, I think, I mean, there's still, obviously, there's a huge potential for misuse, although actually the interesting thing is if you look at some recently released AI, AI technologies like the GPT-2, which was released by OpenAI, they had a big model. This is a, a, an AI that generates text, like human language, and they were reluctant to release the full model because they thought it was going to be used for these kinds of purposes. Um, but it turned out that uh, it, they've released it now and it doesn't seem to have been used for that. So it might be a case of the technology being ahead of the, the people who want to use it for those purposes. But I think in the longer term, there is an incredible danger about these kinds of technologies being used for all sorts of you know, purposes that perhaps weren't intended to be wrong or misguided, but just turn out to it because of, as Sarah points out, the sort of societal structures that we have. And you know, all of these very, very complex um, machine learning systems that we're seeing at the moment, they're becoming very difficult for individuals to get um, down to actually how they work. So they require 
um, often hundreds of millions of dollars worth of equipment, huge amounts of electricity to actually do the training. Um, uh, they require thousands and thousands of servers sitting in a farm somewhere being trained on all of this data that's being collected by usually just a few companies. So, you know, there's, there's this kind of homogenization of culture that's happening through the combination of these new technologies and the sort of algorithmic decision making that we were just talking about, particularly things like recommender systems, something I've written about recently. Um, the idea that um, a machine is recommending something to you, if that machine is also creating that content for you at the same time, I think there's an incredible potential for that to be, um, to be very limiting for human creativity and human culture. And they're, they're the kinds of things that we really need to be mindful of. Yeah, I think that's interesting about the, the prohibitive costs of training these massive models. And mm. I think GPT-3 came out last week mm. um, and I think it cost $40 million to train. So like, you're not going to get, you're not going to get your average kind of, um, you know, researcher at a university or, you know, startup messing with that. And like you say, at every step of that level, and they're training their assumptions and biases being baked into, into the process and into the algorithms and into the data that are you know, completely obscured from the rest of us, I, I think. Mm. Um, but Teresa, I wanted to ask you, um, what, what's something that um, you know, has surprised you um, in the past in, in seeing things, whether it's the, the theatrical work or, or other projects you've done, um, where you might have gone into a project and sort of thought, it's going to turn out like this, but you know, something um, has, has surprised you in the, in the way that the, the, the human and the machine interacted? Uh, well, obviously, the musical has been the, the the biggest thing that has surprised me because when when the the idea was pitched to me, I thought, okay, this is this is kind of impossible. It was, it was also something to be done in in a year, and I thought, okay, this is really stretching the time, and and I thought this this was not possible, but um, that you know it came to to work well, um, and although you know the 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 musical writers that were working with us, they expressed frustration with the systems and also they were pleased with the system in our times. And so this, this kind of interaction, you know, is surprising because we are also frustrated with our human collaborators many times mm -hmm. and pleased with them in other times. So, you know, this, this kind of thing really, really was, of course, a personal thing. But uh, uh, another thing is, is not something that I have worked on, but just seeing the work that is that, that is being done in the area, you know, just very close to, to our door in, in Sensi Lab, um, the work of Nina, uh, a PhD student of, of the lab. Uh, she's working in, in understanding human emotion and she has developed this mirror in which it can detect how it can, that it does emotion um, analysis of, of your face and then it, it gives you a, uh, it shows you a poem and it's just amazing. I think what surprised me is there is no boundaries, you know, in, in, in this work of creative and AI, creativity and AI. So you just, you can just, you know, have a mirror displaying this, this, this poem and, and, and it's just, yeah, there is no boundaries in it. So it's all the, 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 the kind of things that can be done. It's just, that's what surprises me almost. Yeah, I've, I've actually seen that mirror. It's kind of like, I remember thinking, what does the mirror think of me? Like, I, I, feel, like I, I feel like I'm being assessed. Uh, Sarah, I might throw one of these audience questions to you, if that's um, okay. So Dell asks, should we allow AI to come up with novel solutions to problems? Um, do we require them, do we, uh, should we be required to verify them for implications on human life before they're put into practice? I think this is a build, possibly Dell might have been um, yeah, it might have triggered this question from what you're talking before anyway. Um, yeah, you know, I think we can, uh, we can ask AI to come up with novel solutions to problems. That doesn't mean that we need to apply the solutions that um, AI creates. So, you know, I, I think that's, it's a really exciting prospect to see what machines, you know, what kinds of um, new processes, new possibilities machines can, can bring into our world and how we might want to think about those. Um, but I think, as I said before, um, we really need to identify what the problem is and whose problem it is that, mm. that we're trying to solve um, if, we, if we're going to search for solutions. Um, I'm kind of a bit more interested in searching for ways forward mm -hmm. um, than solutions and, and thinking about how, how machines might participate in the, our way forward in, in the world. 
um, rather than thinking how they might actually address a problem and create a solution that closes down what's wow. going to happen next into a particular static state. So, um, yes, on one level, I, I do, I agree. It'd be great to, yeah. to see what AI can contribute. But, but let's think about that as being interwoven and entangled with the many other things and processes that are happening in our world and things that people do. It's an interesting point you make about sort of, um, sort of helping, using AI to help us sort of step forward rather than close off a problem. Mm. Um, have, have you experienced, I mean, I, I've seen a bit of this in our work, but have you seen, does it feel sometimes like that these, these challenges are very binary in nature and that, and that it, is, it, is, it is decided there's a decision or there's a recommendation or a suggestion or an output and that really the framing of that, the building of that algorithm or, or system um, it's much harder to create something that leads to something that's more open because you know machine learning tries to make a very sort of accurate prediction. Yeah. I mean, I would answer that perspective um, actually by, by thinking about well, how those processes develop within our contemporary society, within industry, within the kind of short-termism of many of the responses that actually have to be created um, in a process whereby maybe a technology is going to market. Um, we, so there's a there's a very kind of particular dynamic within which much kind of technology design, design and development happens. Um, but that's why I, which calls for solutions in many ways. Um, but I think, but that's why I think that actually John and, and Teresa's work is, is so interesting because it takes those kinds of technologies into creative practice, which I would think can be much more open and can actually think about weaving those, those ways forward in, into our unknown futures with machines and with technology in such ways that don't have to be closed down into solutions. So I think that actually I, I would love to hear from them rather than I'm speculating about it myself because that's what I think is so exciting. It is. Um, I might throw to John, there's a few audience questions coming in. I want to get to a few more before we, before we wrap up. Um, John, I hope you might have a good perspective on this one. Um, will I, this is from Cade. Thank you, Cade. Will AI help us better attribute the source of inspiration for our internal creative algorithm? E.g., what have been the references, <coughs> excuse me, references, conscious or subconscious, that's informed the work? So I guess this is coming from the, you know, everything is a remix kind of, you know, school of thought. Um, will it help us attribute that? Have you seen any examples of that working like that? Yeah, I think so. I mean, even in my own work, um, often the system that I'm working with comes up with an idea or, or some some kind of feature that that you're working on and you think why you know why did it do that why why, why wouldn't I have thought of that and they think maybe I would have thought of that but I would have done it in a different way so it's not just simply about the production of ideas it's actually about I think when it's beneficial it's questioning the way that you work and the assumptions that you make so being able to ask those questions. And often, you know, when people deal with machines, they're often a little bit more open than they are with people because they think the machine's not gonna judge them so much. And I certainly, I don't think of the computer systems that I work with as, as anywhere near as judgmental as perhaps ah. artistic peers. Well, the mirror, the mirror is judgmental. <laughs> yeah, not very judgmental. So you do feel like you can open up to them and um, you, you, have a, you have a kind of freedom of, of expression because you know they're not gonna make that judgment. They're just simply responding to what you're doing. So, yeah, I think that's, that's actually a really positive way in which you can use these technologies to actually um, it, it kind of expand the, what you consider to be your creative possibilities and also the way that you undertake your creative life. I think being able to develop that is actually really important for everyone, not just for people who deem themselves as creative, as I think Sarah mentioned at the beginning. You know, creativity is something that empowers societies and it only works that way when everyone is considered to be creative. It's not just an elite kind of thing that's just for a few people. So yeah. really, if these technologies help in the democratization of that, I think that's a really interesting step that, um, you know, that, that, that could be a positive benefit for them. Absolutely, that's an exciting aspect. Um, I might throw this one to you, Teresa, um, from Wayne. Um, probably a bit broader than the AI creativity discussion, but um, this is in the, to the realms of jobs being automated. Are the repetitive tasks being taken away or do you see the repetitive tasks being taken away that sort of junior or inexperienced employees used to do um, by some of these systems? Um, and does that make it difficult for um, you know, younger people to have a pathway into employment or will it? Uh, no, I don't think so. I mean, yeah, it, it is true that some of the repetitive tasks uh, come 
can be taken. But I think that actually uh, opens many more possibilities, you know, and that has been shown since the Industrial Revolution, you know, when this kind of uh, repetitive tasks, jobs are taken from technology, there are new jobs opportunity that, opportunities that come up and we actually get inspired by them. We, we create new problems ourselves, you know, when something has been solved, we, we just see more than, you know, beyond that. So I think um, it, it, it doesn't know, it, it will open uh, new possibilities and young people would even young people we see them you know like you you see now young people uh, having these jobs influencers and all these kind of things that um, I, you know they they didn't exist at that time and it's thanks to technology the technology that is there and they are just using it in these very creative ways and young people are very creative as well so i don't yeah i don't think that would be yeah, I think it's, it's an interesting question. Obviously, it's, it's one of the more topical aspects of AI in general, automation. Um, and, you know, I think I mentioned this the other day, someone said to me, it's AI isn't coming, the robots aren't coming for your jobs, management's coming for your jobs. You know, if, if, there's, if there's cost to be saved, I mean, that's always been a way of, um, you know, yeah. capitalist companies working and thriving in, 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 in especially challenging economies like this. So that's probably the, the bigger worry about, um, I agree. I think by framing it um, as these jobs used to exist in exactly that way and they're gone, it's not a zero-sum game, is it? I think there's going to be, it, it's going to be quite messy in a lot of industries. But, um, you know, I, I agree. I think there's a lot of reason for optimism that young people sort of you know, reinvent roles and, and, and yeah. working as well. I think this one might be for you, um, Sarah, um, from Tyler. Um, on the back of using AI for nefarious purposes... Ferris is one of my favourite words. If creating and training AI becomes easier each day, will there become a point when something potentially dangerous does get released? And is there something governments can be doing to prevent this? I will add, do we want governments involved in preventing this? Are they the ones to prevent it? So there's a lot to take in there, but basically, you know, it, obviously, um, if it can be used for nefarious purposes, um, will there be something potentially dangerous released in society? And, and how, what can we do to address that? Well, you know, I think that people, of course, will, some people will always use things for nefarious purposes and, and um, whatever the technologies that are available, we need to be attentive um, to, to the, the, the possibility of that happening. Mm. Um, so, you know, maybe one thing to do is to learn from the past. Who do we want to, to kind of, you know, police and, and regulate those kinds of uses? Um, how do we embed in their design um, technologies which might prevent that? Um, so, yeah, there, there, there are many questions, I think, around that that are quite easily answered. Mm -hmm. um, I think, again, we, we need to just recognise um, what those different strands in our contemporary society are and how they work. Um, and to consider that any new technologies are, are just as likely as any old technologies to be mm -hmm. kind of purposed or repurposed for, for things that we may not wish them to be purposed for. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, yeah, the the looking out for that's got to be embedded in, in anything. Yeah, I think you're right. I think, I think one of the themes of this has been sort of, you know, look behind the scenes to the humans rather than sort of use the technology as a crutch or an excuse to, to work out where it might be going because, you know, human intentions and human agenda is, is behind everything, I guess. And I think if, um, you know, one of the things that I've kind of often thought about in relation to self-driving cars is that, you know, when you ask, you know, will people hack self-driving cars, for example? Well, of course, you would imagine that that's going to happen, but haven't people always hacked their cars, mm. um, but in different ways? So I think there's a historical precedent for, for most things that we can look at. And, and so I guess really thinking about the, the historical trajectory of the, um, not just the, the AI, but also the historical trajectory of the kind of thing that AI, AI might be imitating or mm -hmm. similar to in terms of past technologies and kind of interventions in our worlds as well. And that, that's where it can become curious so, because our, often the answer to the question is not where we would immediately first look. Yeah. The answer to the question is, is tangential, yeah. it's somewhere else. It's somewhere not in the car. Line, somewhere <laughs> <that's hidden. Yeah. laughs> Teresa, I might go for the last question for you. This is bringing back to sort of creativity and creative practice. Um, this is from Malika, I think, I'm um, sorry. First name and surname kind of rolled into one, I think. Um, Teresa said that sometimes musicians felt frustrated with the AI. Do you recall an example? Because you said that sometimes we get frustrated with our human collaborators. This is true. And I would like to know what was the case with the AI. So, 
sometimes musicians get frustrated with AI. What's an example you've seen in that? Uh, uh, for instance, uh, very particular to the, to the musical uh, was, for instance, that, um, you know, see some, some of the systems would just throw many different possibilities to the, to the musicians, to the musical writers, sorry. And, and so they have to, you know, browse through all these, I don't know, 100 different options and that, that was really tiring. And they were frustrated about the fact that the, that the system wasn't able, you know, to narrow down uh, these, these possibilities, for instance. So that's, that was one of the, one of the things they, they, I remember one of the musical writers saying, oh, I wouldn't use this system ever again, unless, you know, this is better. And this is, again, going back to, to the collaboration, to, to having machines having a more active role. You know, they need to reason more. Be, they, they, they need to have more capabilities to be able to reason about the things that they are doing. So, mm. so yeah, uh, uh, that's, that's one of the examples. Yeah. I, guess, I guess the person who said there's no such thing as a bad idea had never worked with AI. <laughs> yeah. But there's no such thing as a bad idea. It works well when, when it's like a human brain constraint who can't sort of you know, spit out 10,000 ideas at once and, <laughs> and most of them are bad. Yeah. Um, we might have time for one more question. I guess um, in just in, in wrapping up, this has been a fantastic chat. So thank you, everybody. Um, my throw to you first, John. What milestone do you think needs to be reached for a significant leap forward in creativity and AI? What's an example of a milestone? Well, I think one milestone is interesting. This is I didn't think this one up, so I can't take credit for it. But um, I was at a panel session last year, which was a group of music AI researchers and musicians, and they were the, the same question was asked. And one of the researchers said when a human takes ownership of a creative output and embraces it, that's a real milestone for AI. And he, this, this research is French, Francois Pache, who, who Teresa and I know, um, who works for Spotify now, had developed a system where he worked with a professional musician and created um, a, a whole album based, based on this AI system. And he said that the musician actually took ownership of it and was, you know, he cared about, what the machine was doing. And I think that is a, is a real master. He, he cared about it as a creative partner, mm. not just as a tool. Like, you know, you work with tools, you work with paintbrushes or guitars or things, but you, maybe you don't um, take ownership of them in the same way. So I think that hurdle has been, been reached. I think the next big hurdle is really um, the, the way that the work is, is created. I think it's the how people actually interact with the AI. It's not what the technology is capable of, because clearly it's capable of doing interesting things, but it's how you how you actually interact with it in a way that's useful for people rather mm -hmm. than useful on a technological or an engineering level. And we haven't reached that yet. Mm -hmm. Um, we might need to wrap up then. That's that's not a bad way to wrap up. I like that your answer to that was not a well, not a technical one, but more of a you know a human psychological social one. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to thank everybody for their contributions, John, Sarah, and Teresa. That's that's been a, a, a really enlightening um, discussion. And, and thank you to the audience for for both turning up and and, and popping in your questions. Um, they were great questions. Um, thank you to the the Monash Tech Talks team who put a lot of work into um, putting this together for everybody. Mm. And um, we'd love you to be able to um, uh, fill out a survey and let us know what you're thinking. Uh, the, the, the survey is in the chat now, the link to the survey. Um, love to f sort of see what you thought of the event and any, any kind of suggestions or just, you know, just compliments is fine as well. Um, and that's at minus.edu slash IT slash MTT, but you can see that in the chat. Um, so thank you, everybody, and um, we'll wrap it up there and um, I hope you have a, a great rest of Monday. We'll see you at the, the next Monash Tech Talk. Thank you.